Um, Marie, Marie, you're about approximately 50, 50 miles north from us. Colder country than Santa Clara or San Juan Pueblo. What I want to have you talk for a little bit is what kinds of plants, vegetables, what did your grandmother, what did your mother, what did your father, what did they grow? Because it was a shorter, shorter season, obviously. Would you do that? Thanks. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Marie Reyna. I'm from the Pueblo of House, but my mother, Owapoy, was Annie Cotter Reyna from O.K. Owenge. Um, she was, as far as we know, the first Native woman to graduate from what was then called New Mexico. Um, it's now New Mexico State, but it was New Mexico A&M. And um, she met my father when she came to teach at our girl of Indian Affairs School. And um, that's where our family began. Um, as a child, um, my greatest experiences were going to my grandmother and grandfather's um, home, Bolario and Cucuta Reina. Um, as you, most of you know, um, the Pueblo people have a long history from the beginning of time of farming. Um, beans, corn, squashes, and in town, um, those three sisters are still planted along with blue corn, sweet corn, and white corn. And as Tessie said, we are further up north, and so we have a very short growing season. We try to start planting in early May, but we could have smoke, uh, snow in May. Um, we depend on the mountain snowpack um, that feeds the rivers, which then feeds the, all the various um, dishes or acequias as they're known uh, in Spanish. But it is a very hard um, and limited time period for us to grow our crops. And for many uh, Native people uh, from, say, Mesa Verde area on down as they made the migration um, to, to the west and into the Rio Grande Valley, um, they have excellent growing times. They can grow melons. We only grew melons once. <laughs> and then our boys who are in our traditional doings raided our, our garden and took them all and we followed their little footprints and then we found where they sat there and gorged themselves. <laughs> and then a few feet later we saw where they had to have <laughs> chuckle. But um, it's pretty difficult. In fact, um, I have a program, I'm the director of the Uuna Art Center at Taos Pueblo, and we have a program called the Heritage Project, uh, Tiwa Language, Culture, History, and Art. And through that program, we have access to my father's family home, my grandparents' home, which provides a nice little lawn area, and then an area where um, our students plant um, annually. Well, this is um, this year is exactly what Tessie's talking about. Everything was going well. Our plants, our beans, our squash, our pumpkins, our blue corn were coming along really nice. And then we got no rain. And then when we have no rain and we didn't have the large amount of snow uh, pack in the mountains, the level of the river uh, begins to drop. And where our water comes from is about a half a mile from uh, my grandparents' place. And uh, when the water's high, no problem. But now the water has dropped and there's very little water in the river right now. And so we lost our source of irrigation, and then it got cold all of a sudden, and now usually we harvest in October, but everything has gotten cold, and it makes it um, very difficult. So in my history class, uh, my students are from five years old to about 12, and we talk about ancestral problem farming, that has existed within our cultures for many generations. 
But then we also talk about how the people who have to leave Mesa Verde because of the 100 year drought and the population was too large and the natural resources uh, were uh, being uh, diminished. Well, Taos is a hunter-gatherer and farming community. And um, I asked them when it got cold and we didn't have any rain, I said, can you imagine what it would be like if you were dependent on this? This was your only source of food. What would we have for the winter time? Would we make it through the winter time? And that's something that many of us uh, who farm at, in Taos deal with every year. Because it can snow, like I said, in May. And then maybe we'll have a good year with rain and plenty of snow melt. But then all of a sudden, here comes the fall. And it came a lot earlier than year, this year. So our red beans, we're going to let them dry on the vine so that we collect those to use those for the next year. And the seeds that um, the blue corn and the red beans are heritage beans that have been grown for generations at Taos Pueblo. And um, it's important to realize how uh, the Pueblo people have managed to grow their food and make it to this point in time. And now climate change comes around and who knows what's going to happen. But I wish to instill in my students the tradition of Pueblo farming and the various heritage seeds that we use. And those particular two crops are seeds that we've been growing when my Anna Awatpoi, uh, she passed and I found a little garbage can and it had several ears of um, blue and white corn and a whole bunch of red beans. And we've been planting that heritage, just finished its 11th year. Um, it's an immersion program in which our children learn about our culture and the use of foods that we used in ceremony and it's important because we have young boys in our kivas and they are reliant on their family and extended family to buy, provide these traditional foods um, during the, in some cases, 18 months and for the other younger boys, six months. So they are dependent on this traditional food and as we all know, it takes a village to raise a child, and this is where all the extended family comes. I come from a family that has always um, planted. Uh, when I was little, we still uh, did uh, many of the things by um, horse and wagon. And um, many of our people had summer homes a little north of the village and east of the village, in which the larger fields of corn, beans, squash, pumpkins um, were being grown. And uh, this is the first uh, time in several years that I'm experiencing where we may not be able to harvest, you know, a lot of our crops because of the uh, climate. But um, my uncles, my dad, my aunties, they all had large fields and um, for the longest time as a child across my father's home, I uh, used to watch Mr. Maribald come with his horse drawn equipment and cut his alfalfa to rake it and then bring his hay wagon and load that up with his hay and take it to his corral. Uh, my neighbor to the left of me was an elderly man named Ventura Maribald. And um, he did the same thing, but eventually he was able to buy a real old tractor, a real old one. And um, we used to hear him coming down. Then my grandparents uh, did everything by horse, and they used to travel about maybe four miles to their summer home. And then eventually my grandfather got a tractor. But one time he hooked up the tractor to the wagon, 
and he was taking my grandmother and my cousin Annie out to the field, and Grandpa's tractor was kind of loud, and he would sing. They would always sing when they were going somewhere. And um, he got to the summer house, and when he got off his tractor, Grandma and Annie weren't there. The wagon had become unhitched from his tractor, so he had to turn around and go back and find Grandma and Grandpa. And we had a small little summer house there, so as children we were always going out there because they would spend the night to irrigate or cultivate. And I have an older uh, cousin, Alfred Montoya, and he spent a lot of time with my grandpa going out there doing that. And by doing that, just like Walter, he learned a great deal. My grandpa was a great storyteller. He would tell them about the stars, the moon. And then they would irrigate at night. And sometimes at night, because it's coming off the river, you could hear the fishes, um, you know, splashing around in the field. So he would run around and gather fish, and then in the morning they would have it for breakfast. <laughs> um, I felt the greatest place in the world for me as a child was being able to go to my grandparents' house at the village. Um, there were things that just weren't happening right in, between my father and my mother, and suddenly I found myself not being able to go to grandma's. So when my grandfather passed away, he gave my younger brother his horses. I was all bummed. And then my brother didn't want them. So my dad gave them to me, and I had transportation. So my mom would have my chores ready. And as soon as I got them, and sometimes I um, get up at night and do some of the, my chores so I could get done by lunch. And after lunch, I just get my horses and um, I'd ride up, I'd pick up a cousin or two or another friend that had a horse. And, but all the time I always went to see my grandparents first. And from there is where I got my foundation. And I realized I came from a generation of farmers. Actually my grandfather also raised milk cows. And he sold milk to our day school. And uh, he did that for many years, and my grandmother used to make cheese. And that was an awesome thing. And a lot of our people in our community came to my grandmother's house to purchase the milk or purchase the cheese. And um, that's where my partner, who I, I have, live with now, Carl Concha, um, he says that's when he met me. That I was standing on the stairway to the top house I was wearing a dress, and I said, yeah, that's probably me. And he came with his sister to buy milk. And then several, what, 25 years later, uh, we meet up again. And he grew up with his grandpa, who was a big farmer. I mean, farming, you know, 10 acres of whatever. And he used to share crop, too. So because on his family, his mother and his aunt had boys, um, and they lived near the village, they all gathered and he would come and wake them up at different times of the morning and say, it's time to go. We have to plant or we've already planted, we have to go cultivate or we have to irrigate. And so Carl grew up with day-to-day uh, -day, uh, traditional farming at Taos Pueblo and now he's in charge in the heritage project of our student garden. So he goes up with the kids, they clean the ditches, and it's about a, a, about a three quarters of a mile that we clean. Then they have to um, create the dam in the river to bring the water down. And so the kids do this, and then they love it. And you can hear them when, before they even get to the site because they're screaming around and they're chasing the water, and they can't believe that we're bringing the water down and we're bringing it to the garden. And the children are responsible for irrigating, weeding. When the grasshoppers came this year, we were like, oh my God, because everybody was losing their gardens to them. And Carl had this idea, why don't we just capture them all? 
So uh, we have about anywhere from 15 to 20 kids a, a day. So he set them out and they started capturing all the grasshoppers and putting them in a jar. And then we reminded them, oh, these are good um, bait for fishing. So we knew what we were doing with those. And so our garden managed to survive. But once the rain stopped, once the water level dropped, um, our kids were having to go to the river making little dams and carrying water by the bucket pool and watering the garden. Uh, in time, I hope to have our old well back and then that will help um, continue to uh, feed that as long as our water level is great. But we still grow the traditional foods that our Provo has been growing for generations and we have made the adjustment. I think that's one of the greatest qualities of Provo people is that we're very flex flexible, that we will adapt to whatever situation we have and use whatever skills our grandparents and our ancestors left to help us uh, make our gardens grow. And remember, everybody, that our supermarkets only have basically two weeks of product. If something were to go wrong, like it did in Taos about five years ago, where we had tremendous snowstorms, they couldn't bring in this amounts to uh, restock Smiths and Albertsons and Super Safe. But for us at the village, because we plant and we save and we store, and we're also hunters and gatherers, that we have clues. And my mother being a home economics teacher, she literally taught my peers' parents all about canning, sewing, and such. And so even to this day, and prior to her passing, her former students would come to talk to her and tell her how grateful they were that they had her as a teacher. And an uh, elder man came, and he's not married, but he told my mom, you know, Miss Cotter, I never married. I have girlfriends, but I never married. <coughs> and she said, but why? I didn't need to have a wife, Mrs. Cotter, because she taught me to cook, <coughs> to sew, to can. So I just had girlfriends. <laughs> and, I, and I thought that was pretty cool. And as I was growing up as a teenager, they, my relatives would tell me of the influence that my mother had. And um, for me, as a young child growing up, the influence of my grandparents and my relatives and the tradition of carrying on Pueblo farming. It will be a task for us in the future as climate change will affect all of us. But um, thank you much. Marie, uh, grasshoppers were bad at Santa Clara. We couldn't grow anything either. And then the squirrels came and took away the tomatoes. But you know what? Uh, in the same book that was put together, uh, there's a quote that, that I'm reminded of when you talk about inhibitor. Things that keep our crops from growing, whether it's the cold weather, whether it's a fall coming too, too quickly, uh, insects, grasshoppers, squirrels, whatever it is, Underhill in 1946 said this about Zuni. He said, weeds in this dry country were not such a bad problem as the hungry birds. No one ever thought of more schemes to keep away the birds and especially crows than the Zuni. They stretched strings on stakes across their fields like a forest of clotheslines. And from the strings, they hung rough, scratchy cactus leaves. They arranged nooses of hair to catch the crows, and they caught plenty. They made scarecrows in every horrible shape. Children and old people stayed in the fields while the corn was ripening, shouting and throwing stones to scare the birds. <laughs>